In this small tutorial series, I want to cover the handling of pitch in Bitwig Studio. There are great videos on this already from channels like Polarity, Tash, Brian Bowman, and Bitwig themselves. But as I intend to reference these concepts a lot in future videos, I thought I'd make my own going over the basics. I'll start with concepts that apply to the DAW as a whole and then expand into the grid in the next video. This tutorial will focus on key tracking, which sounds kind of boring, but given the extent of Bitwig's modularity, it's actually a really useful thing to understand. A quick note before we begin. This tutorial makes a lot of references to MIDI octave numbers, and sadly there's no agreed standard for which octave should have which number. In Bitwig, C3 equals 262 Hz, whilst in Span, the spectrum analyzer I'm using for these demonstrations, that same note is referred to as C4. I'll always refer to notes by their number as given in Bitwig, so just remember, if you see e.g. A4 in Span, this is actually A3 in Bitwig. With the exception of a handful of devices, almost every frequency or pitch-based tool in Bitwig respects a common tuning standard and methodology. The first thing to remember is that C3, 262 Hz, is the central pitch in Bitwig Studio. Most filters and oscillators will default to this pitch if you double-click on their frequency knob to reset them. So what do I mean by central note? To illustrate, let's use a device that contains key tracking ability by default. The resonator bank, for example. Here, I have a short noise sample playing to excite the resonator bank, or else it won't make any sound on its own. But the noise has no pitch, and is playing without any key tracking. Only one resonator is enabled in the resonator bank, so it's just going to produce a single pitch. I'll set the pitch of this single resonator to C3, to keep things simple. Now let's turn the key tracking up to 100% on the resonator bank. This little icon here means key tracking in Bitwig, most of the time. Let's play a note and see what happens. To start with, I'll also play C3, our central pitch. Now as we can see on my spectrum analyzer, the resonator bank is indeed producing a note at 262Hz. That's C3 in Bitwig terminology, C4 in span. Now what if I play an A3 MIDI note instead? Remember that I haven't changed the pitch on the resonator bank. That's still set to C3. Nice. A4 on span, which means A3 in Bitwig. The resonator bank has changed pitch to follow our input note. Now what about if I play a C major scale, starting from C3? Hopefully by this point, you all agree that the resonator bank is playing the exact pitch corresponding to the MIDI note that I'm playing into it. This is what I mean by central pitch. If you set the frequency of any pitch tracking device in Bitwig to C3 and enable 100% key tracking, it'll automatically track the exact pitch of any MIDI note played into it. To confirm this, I'll quickly switch back and forth between our resonator bank patch and a simple phase 4 synthesized sound. As you can hear, they're playing exactly the same pitch. What happens if you set the device's pitch to something that isn't C3? Let's have a look. In this second example, I'm running a simple noisy polysynth sound through the resonator bank. The polysynth is set to its default pitch, meaning once again, a C3 MIDI note will produce a sound with a fundamental at C3. Initially, I'll also set the resonator bank to C3 again. You can see and hear it producing a rather ugly peak, as the high resonance is centered exactly on the fundamental of our polysynth sound. Let's change the resonator frequency, up a fifth to G3. Once again, I'm still playing MIDI note C3 into these devices. The polysynth sound stays at C3, as expected, whilst the resonator bank is now generating a pitch at G3. If I change the input MIDI note to A3, we can see that the polysynth fundamental is correctly tracked up to A3, but that the resonator's also moved up by the same interval, a fifth above A3 to E3. With key tracking at 100%, Bitwig devices will retain their exact pitch offset, or interval if you prefer, relative to C3, the central note. Or phrased in another way, playing a C3 note into a Bitwig device with its key tracking set to 100% will tell the device to play the exact note it's showing on its front panel. Playing any other note will offset the resulting note by the distance between the note you've just played and C3. If you play a C5, for example, the device will play a note two octaves higher than whatever you set the tuning to on the front panel. If you play a G2, it'll play five semitones lower than whatever you set on the front panel, as G2 is five semitones below our center of C3. 
What about devices without key tracking? Luckily, we're using Bitwig, so if a device can't do something by default, there's usually a modulator to help. This is true, of course, for key tracking. Let's go back to our simple atonal noise sample and add a filter. As you can see, the filter doesn't have a key tracking knob by default, unlike the resonator bank. So let's add a key track modulator. At first glance, this modulator is a little confusing. I don't want to go into a deep dive into the key track modulator here. So for the purposes of this tutorial, let's stick to relative mode. Relative mode lets you set the middle frequency or root with which you want to work and the number of semitones that the key track modulator will span before it reaches its maximum modulation value. Luckily for us, the default settings are nearly always the settings you'll want to use, at least until you got the hang of how this pitch stuff works and want to try something more interesting. So let's add some modulation from the key track to the filter frequency. You might have wondered what the modulation unit is that shows up when you modulate a filter in Bitwig. It's actually semitones, which is convenient. Then how many semitones do we want to modulate the filter by? This next bit is a little bit confusing to get your head round to start with, but once you get to grips with it, you'll feel much more comfortable with Bitwig's modulation in general. The key track modulator will produce a modulation value of zero with an input MIDI note of C3, our root, i.e. no modulation will be applied to the target parameter. So if our filter corner frequency is set to C3 and we play a MIDI note of C3, the filter should stay exactly where it is. The key track modulator will produce its maximum modulation value of 100% or 1 if we play a note 64 semitones above C3, which is E8, a note you're unlikely to use unless you're making ambient music for dogs. As we want our filter to key track our MIDI notes perfectly, theoretically we also want our filter to resonate at this note should we decide to play it. So to do that, we need to modulate the filter with a depth of 64 semitones, i.e. When we play a note 64 semitones above C3, we want our filter to also move up all 64 semitones. So with that setting, what would happen if we play the slightly more reasonable note 32 semitones above C3, which happens to be G-sharp 5? Well, the key track is now halfway to its maximum value, so it'll produce a modulation value of 50%, or 0.5. That means our filter will have half of its maximum modulation value of 64 semitones applied. 32 semitones as well. How convenient. We've set up semitone perfect key tracking at least up until E8, at which point the key track is topped out at 100% and will stop adding modulation. Note that the key track modulator is perfectly symmetric in relative mode, so all of the same is true for notes below C3, just they tell the filter to go lower than its current value, down to minus 64 semitones, rather than higher. Let's play a few MIDI notes in to test that. KeyTrack works like this for any device which has its parameters set in semitones. For devices that don't have their parameters set in semitones, uh, let's forget about those for today. Maybe I'll cover them in a later tutorial. I suggest that when you first start using the KeyTrack modulator, use it in the way that I just described, with its root at C3. This mirrors the way that Bitwig's inbuilt key tracking works on devices that have the capability and helps to familiarize you with this paradigm. So. To recap, we've learned that all Bitwig devices with internal key tracking have a reference note of C3. Input notes above C3 will tell your device to play higher than its current setting. Input notes lower than C3 will tell your device to play lower than its current setting. If your device pitch is set to C3, then it will produce the exact note you play into it. With your device set to any other pitch than C3, playing C3 on your keyboard will tell the device to play its current setting. Playing notes above or below C3 will move its pitch up or down by whatever interval you play relative to C3. We can reproduce this behavior on devices that don't have internal key tracking by using the key track modulator with its root set to C3 and its modulation set to a depth of N semitones, where N is the span that we're using in the key track modulator. Usually you'll want to use 64 semitones, but if you only want your key tracking to apply to a limited range, then you could use 12 and 12, for example. A little bonus tip at this point. You might have seen me and other users typing pitches directly into filter frequency fields, for example. Get used to doing this. It's much faster than dragging with your mouse or searching the internet for the frequency that you need. Just remember to delete the leftover HZ, Hertz characters, or it won't work.
For assigning modulation, you can also type exact modulation depths in the inspector. This is really handy for setting up key tracking where you need accurate numeric values. I hope to cover some novel uses of these features in future videos, but for now, to keep this one relatively concise, I think that just about covers it for part one of this tutorial. Thanks for watching, take it easy, and I'll see you in part two for a thorough exploration of pitch in the grid.